Welcome to End of the X Waiver, A New Frontier in Addiction Treatment. My name is Merlene Tucker, and I'll be running this Dialogue for Health web form alongside my colleague, Jeff Bornstein. Thank you to our partner for today's event, the National Overdose Prevention Network, a program of the PHI Center for Health Leadership and Impact. Meet the moderator of today's event, Dr. Mary Maddox Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is a coach and preparedness consultant for the California Overdose Prevention Network, a program of the PHI Center for Health Leadership and Impact. She served as the Sonoma County Public Health Officer and Division Director and the Chief Medical Officer of the Redwood Community Health Coalition for Sonoma, Napa, Yolo, and Marin Counties. She has been a board member and chair of the Latino Coalition for a Healthy California. Welcome, Mary. Thank you very much, Merlene, and welcome to all of you to this very important webinar today about a, such an important topic that will have such a tremendous impact on our availability to offer addiction treatment. Um, could I have the next slide, please? We are so pleased that we are going to have Dr. Renit Lev work on the presentation. Dr. Lev was the first chief medical officer of the White House Office of the National Drug Control Policy, also known as the ONDCP. What is really wonderful about her being in that position is she really brought frontline clinical experience to that role and to the development of national health policy. She's a nationally acclaimed medical expert and speaker, and she continues to treat patients in the emergency department. As a mother of four, she's very familiar with the struggles and challenges that, that families face, and she uses data to drive data and is frequently quoted, quoted in print and in television media. She even has a podcast, High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, that provides a weekly program talking about policy and uh, some of the practical and clinical issues around addiction and treatment. Dr. Lev is a certified, board certified both in emergency medicine and addiction medicine. She has over 25 years of experience treating individuals with addiction. When, she, when at the time she came to the White House to uh, in her role there, she was the chief of the emergency department at Scripps Mercy Hospital in, in uh, San Diego. Also in San Diego in 2012, she established and chaired the San Diego Prescription Drug Abuse Medical Task Force. This was the first of its kind in California in terms of a task force that integrated physicians of various specialties, along with hospitals, law enforcement, hospital administration, treatment programs, and public health, all for the purpose of decreasing deaths and mortality from prescription drugs. Dr. Lev from the University of Texas Medical School in San Antonio and received her completed her emergency medicine residency training at U University of California, San Diego. As you will see, she is an energetic leader and really brings passion to assisting communities and individuals pre and preventing and treating addiction both in the direct clinical setting and a very important setting of policy. Can I have the next slide, please? I do want to mention that in addition to um, the, talking with Dr. Lev, we're going to have a couple of poll questions, and then we are also going to have, as what Marlene mentioned, an important opportunity for you to ask questions of Dr. Lev. Next slide, please. Our learning objectives really uh, are focused on your understanding the implications, the very important implications of this recent elimination of the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency DEA X waiver requirement. Uh, also, you're gonna learn about some barriers to medication assisted treatment and new opportunities that can enhance access to, to treatment. You'll also be hearing about some very practical steps that you can take and that clinicians in your community can take to prescribe addiction treatment to more individuals. And I get to finally introduce Dr. Lev. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with, you with us, Dr. Ronit Lev. Um, you can join us on the, we will start with our questions. We are very interested in learning your perspective on this important issue. So Dr. Lev, I'd like to start out, you know, particularly as we saw in the, in the survey questions, the poll questions, there's some fair number of people who, 
haven't heard a lot about the X waiver before, I think it's really helpful to know what this was and why it had such an impact on the ability to, uh, for individuals to access medication-assisted treatment. Can you explain a little bit about what the X waiver was and how it used to function before this recent change? Of course. Thank you, Mary um, uh, Medas Gonzalez, for inviting me to this webinar. Really, a pleasure to be part of the National Overdose Prevention Network and and answer uh, some questions. So, so let's start with what's the X? What is the X in the X waiver? So the X of the X waiver comes from the letter X that's placed in front of the DEA license to providers who have qualified and registered to provide buprenorphine. For example, as an X waiver physician, I have two DEA numbers, my regular DEA number and my X one. My X waiver number is identical to my regular DEA number. It just has an X in front of it. So now what does that X do for me? The X waiver allowed me to prescribe buprenorphine to treat opioid addiction, also known as opioid use disorder. The X means I've registered with the government and met the qualifications to prescribe this single drug. Having an X waiver meant the DEA would do increased inspection on my medical records and clinical practice. And there are horror stories of physicians forced to cancel patients as DEA inspectors came to the doctor's office unannounced. The DEA since stopped doing such inspections over the past few years, but the fear of increased government scrutiny on prescribings remained a fear. Interestingly, I never needed an X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine for pain. And I also never needed an X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine within the hospital setting. So I want to give um, the listeners a little history lesson about where the X waiver comes from. The story of the X waiver starts in 1914 with the Harrison Anti-Narcotic Act. That was a federal response to increase opium and cocaine addiction by limiting manufacturing and taxation. And it was also meant to limit physicians for providing narcotics to patients who were addicted. And yet it was not considered enough. And way back then, doctors and pharmacists were accused of creating a drug epidemic. It's very interesting for me. I read an article in the American Journal of Public Health from 1915. And here it goes. It says, it is a daily becoming known that opium, its derivatives, and cocaine are being used in alarming amounts all over this country. It has been shown repeatedly that the physician is the greatest single factor in drug addict formation, worse than the patent medicine man, worse than the criminalist druggist, worse than dissipation and vice. Meanwhile, the prescribing of these drugs goes merrily all over the United States. Interesting. Um, the public health officers way back then were doctor bashing um, and didn't think the Harrison Act was enough to curb overprescribing. Next comes 1970 with the Controlled Substance Act signed under President Nixon. The Controlled Substance Act established five schedules to drugs by the FDA and the DEA. Schedule one drugs were considered completely illegal and no medical use. Schedule five drugs had the lowest abuse potential and accepted use. And we still use that schedule today. Then came the Vietnam War. And veterans were returning from combat with addiction to heroin. And treatment became a priority. In 1973, an exception had to be made in order to prescribing laws to allow for methadone. Methadone is a Schedule II narcotic and was approved for treatment for opioid addiction under Title 42 CFR federal regulation. And opioid treatment programs, or OTPs, or methadone clinics, had to register with the DEA and SAMHSA, and to this date are highly monitored. Methadone was not allowed and is still not allowed to be prescribed at a doctor's office to treat addiction. And there are psychiatrists who want to change that. People may forget the memory is short, but at the peak of the opioid prescription epidemic, people were dying of methadone. In the death diary research I did in San Diego, where I studied everyone who died of a medication, I found that methadone by far was the number one um, prescription opioid that people died of as a single drug, not in combination with other drugs. And that's because methadone has a much longer half-life, lasts longer the body than other prescription opioids. It also can cause heart irregularities, and some people have metabolic limitations in being able to metabolize methadone. The peak in methadone deaths led the CDC to issue a warning that was included in their chronic pain guidelines for physicians never to use methadone as a first-line pain agent. Now back to the X waiver. 
Methadone was the only option to treat heroin addiction until new drugs became available to treat heroin and opiate medications, namely buprenorphine. In order to approve new opioid that contain medications to treat addiction, existing laws had to be changed. And in came the X waiver. The X waiver reserved to the Drug Addiction Treatment Act, data 2000 waiver, legislation that authorized the outpatient use of buprenorphine for the treatment of opioid use disorder. The act actually permitted treatment of opiate addiction with any scheduled narcotic medication approved by the FDA, but there's only one narcotic medication approved by the FDA to treat opiate use disorder. So really the law is just about buprenorphine, which is a scheduled three medication. I bet you may not know which Senator authored Data 2000. Data 2000 was authored, was authored by then Senator Joe Biden, along with Senator Hatch and uh, Levine with bipartisan support. So in order to obtain a waiver, the government created a mandatory eight hour course for physicians, 24 hours for nurse practitioners and physician assistants. I took that eight hour course. It was okay, but not great. It was not applicable to my specialty in emergency medicine. It really left me with lots of questions. And I thought the course could be better and shorter. When I worked at the White House, I attended meetings and debates about the X waiver. I would ask anyone who took the course to please raise your hand and uh, mine was the only one up. The initial Data 2000 Act allowed treatment with buprenorphine for up to 30 patients per qualifying physician during their first year, which they could then request increase in limits to 100 patients. Uh, fast forward to 2016, opioid prescription deaths were peaking and Congress passed the CARA Act, Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act that raised the ceiling to allow 275 buprenorphine patients. There's still fear of creating buprenorphine pill mills, just like we had um, opioid pill mills, and therefore there was a cap. In 2018, the Support Act expanded the scope of prescribing to include physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Again, while working at the White House at the beginning of the pandemic, the government was desperate to remove red tape in medicine and any type of medicine or treatment for addiction. And the pandemic crisis allowed the government to take a complete 180 reverse in their X waiver and fueled the movement to X the X waiver. And I'm really proud of my role in Xing the X waiver. I shared pictures of myself in my COVID astronaut suit treating a new disease and made the point that I learned how to treat COVID without an eight hour course. I wrote a policy guideline at ONDCP during COVID pandemic to X the X waiver. And that at the time was really revolutionary and met with controversy. We put together substantial um, endorsement letters from medical affairs um, organizations, and that helped bring it clout. So at the end of the Trump administration, at the end of 2020, the X waiver and the eight hour education was eliminated and the medical community and addiction community celebrated. However, administration changed. The X waiver was put back in place. And although it was a popular rule, I'll leave the speculation of why that happened unanswered. But the Biden administration continued to eliminate the eight-hour education mandate, but kept the X waiver, a requirement for prescribers to register with the government. And it became easier to pres prescribe buprenorphine, but there remained a barrier. The X waiver at this point in history was just stupid. We could prescribe opioids without extra government regulation, but we needed to jump through hoops to treat opioid addiction. The X waiver pro problem was given to Congress to solve, and it took three years. And this year, January 2023, the X waiver was finally eliminated with the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, the MAT Act. And Biden created the X waiver as a senator and signed its death certificate as president. And today, any doctor with a DEA license can prescribe buprenorphine without it. They added X waiver government regulation. But there's a catch. While the president removed the mandated eight hour education with regulation, Congress put it back in. That's kind of a, a brief history and more than you wanted to know about the X waivers. Well, thank you. That's a fascinating to hear all the history of how this came about and very importantly, how it was eliminated. And thank you so much for all of your advocacy to X the X waiver. Uh, such a welcome change. And you know, now that it has this change has occurred, what do you see as kind of some of the initial ripple effects of this? Right. So any change uh you know, causes a transition. People don't always like change or do well with change, but it's here. And the goal is very noble. The goal of it is to remove any barriers to treat opioid use disorder and to increase buprenorphine treatment. 
the immediate ripple effects is now there are 2 million doctors who have a DA license, but less than 5% had an X waiver. All 20 million now can provide can prescribe you for norphine, but there's a gap in education. There's also going to be a scramble now for physicians to meet their eight hours of education criteria, those who don't already have it. And that's a one-time requirement, but that it's also an opportunity. The educational gap in teaching how to prescribe buprenorphine and to treat addiction remains. The medical community needs to create partnerships to help with addiction centers and mental health centers and counselings. These type of connections have not been made and established as we have for the rest of medicine. So this is new and many physicians will not know where to go. And this is where coalitions and people, not physicians, can help the medical community and find these partnerships. The long-term uh, ripple effect, I, I hope, um, is that addiction will become integrated in part of medical care. At your doctor's office, your teen visit, your doctor will ask you, how's your sugar for your diabetes? How's your mental health? And how are you doing with your recovery? So addiction treatment and recovery maintenance will be part of regular doctor medical visits. Mm, that would be wonderful. And we have to work towards that definitely. Um, excellent. Uh, the, you know, it, you talked about some of the issues of education to help with this um, uh, shift occurring and all. We know also there's a lot of stigma around uh, substance use, around addiction treatment. Um, how do you see this being addressed? So let me start with some definitions of uh, MAT and definitions of stigma and, and talk about that way. I just want to make sure our definitions are right. MAT, people say, oh, we need to do more MAT. That stands for Medication for Addiction Treatment. There is MAT for nicotine, for tobacco cessation. There are three FDA-approved medications for alcohol use disorder. And MAT for opioids is also called MOUD, or Medications for Opioid Use Disorder. And there are three FDA-approved medications. Methadone, we touched upon, is only available at OTP clinics for now. It's an agonist, means it works just like an opioid. There's buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist. That means it works partly like an opioid, but also has a sealing effect, so it's harder to overdose or take too much. Suboxone is buprenorphine combined with naloxone, the opioid reversal agent, so it has added protection. And the third medication is naltrexone, also known as Vivitrol. It's an antagonist medication. It's not a scheduled medication. It blocks instead of activates the opioid receptors. It's an option for opioid addiction, but it's harder to start, but you have to be opioid free for seven or 10 days. And it's an injection every four weeks. So let me talk about stigma. Um, stigma is a set of negative, often unfair beliefs that a group of people have about something. So I'm a physician and I have a great admiration to my clinical colleagues. I don't believe that they carry stigma against patients. Doctors sacrifice a lot to get through medical school, residency, board exams, and our primary focus, our love, is taking care of people. So it's important to get inside a doctor's head and mentality if you want to create positive change in medical behavior and attitudes. So let's deconstruct stigma. I approach it from the angle of love of my profession and colleagues rather than bad doctors need to get rid of their stigma. Let's analyze stigma from a medical profession. It may sound like, I don't want to take care of those patients in my office. Or, you know, I just don't like those type of patients. I'm too busy for that. The X waiver was a great excuse to defer addiction treatment and a perfect excuse not to treat or create more work for the doctor. A doctor has covered a lot during a short office visits and addiction and mental health are happily passed on to a different medical provider. The X waiver was a perfect excuse not to treat or create more work. But let's dive deeper. We would ask, why don't you wanna treat people with addiction? And here we can identify the frustrations. It's really frustration that's key. Frustrations in lack of patient compliance, frustration in feeling helpless and ability to help a patient, frustration in increased demand on time, frustration in lack of resources and soon to be frustration of yet another mandate. So now what people define as stigma against treating addiction is really frustration and therefore an opportunity for education and resolving barriers. For example, the frustration of lack of patient compliance. We can educate that addiction is a disease of the brain with relapse rates, similar to diabetes, high blood pressure, or asthma. We don't kick out the asthmatic for um, smoking and we don't punish the diabetic who lost their insulin and ate some cake. We understand this, 
we help medical providers understand the disease of addiction and the brain disease. And physicians love this. They love understanding disease. It's why we all went to medical school. Next is the frustration of not being able to help someone. What do physicians do from methamphetamine or marijuana addiction? We feel helpless. It, it's not much of an option out there except to just say, no, this is bad for you. It's normal to feel frustrated when there are problems that we can't fix or solve. And medical providers want to fix things. But now, with opioid addiction, we have more tools. We have medications. Physicians love that. We like to fix things and like look for things that we know how to treat. What about the frustrations of time? Yet another mandate and a lack of resource. That's real. It has to be acknowledged that it does take extra time. And that's why we have to teach how to do things quickly and efficiently and provide the necessary resources. There is a learning curve to adapting to new treatment but we, the medical community, are very good at learning new things. We learn to treat COVID and monkeypox. We're taught how to overprescribe opioids and then to decrease prescription and uh, taper opioids, prescribe more cautiously and safely. And we will learn how to do new procedures and prescribe new medications. We do this all the time. So with the right education and methodology, we actually enjoy new treatment and innovation. So I would argue in order to eliminate stigma, don't stigmatize the physicians, Rather, educate and provide resources. Act like the drug rep who teaches doctors how to use a new diabetic medication or promote their product. Promote addiction treatment as a rewarding medical service to patients. And please provide physicians and medical providers a referral base for rehab, um, complex addiction services. There's a gap and partnership that we really need. So I have no doubt that to eliminate stigma, it's through clinical understanding and providing treatment tools. Wonderful. Thank you. A very, very complete response to that question. I really appreciate it. And I want to acknowledge the wonderful reactions of our audience. There's keep them coming. They're, they're, your, uh, your responses are generating a lot of responses from our, uh, from our uh, audience also. So um, you, you uh, explained so well some of the issues around uh, the barriers that may exist for individual physicians, but we know now the majority of physicians actually practice in institutions, in organizations, rather than kind of the, the, um, the old fashioned, but the, the prior model of the single practice physician. What do you see, um, what can be done or what has been done on an so that this doesn't just isn't the response of a single physician, but really organizations, institutions take this on and provide some of that support, support that you mentioned is so needed. So increasing MAT or MOUD across institutions and making it an integrated part of medical care requires leadership, education, and incentives. And I would emphasize that this should be for all addiction, not just for opioids. The goal is important from a top down as well as bottom up approach. So from the top down, we've seen the federal government uh, go into place to remove the X waiver, make uh, Narcan over the counter. That's big and we really need to be thankful for that. But of course we want more and there needs to be incentives for screening for substance use disorder and for treatment. So for example, there was a government incentive to screen for tobacco use and refer patients to tobacco cessation. We received a few dollars per smoker and that created a huge motivation. We screened everybody for tobacco use and we referred them all to treatment. It was a bit humorous for me that we counseled smokers, but we didn't say a word about injecting drugs or smoking methamphetamine. We weren't paid to do that, but we can create such incentives through Medicare and commercial insurance. From the bottom up, we need institution, institutions and community clinics to create the partnerships. What makes addiction care different than cardiology or pulmonology specialty care is that addiction treatment, detox rehabs are provided outside the traditional walls of the hospital system. Therefore, partnerships need to be created that may not exist in hospital clinics and doctor's offices. And that's where coalitions could be of great assistance. Each hospital and medical group needs a community addiction partner. Coalitions can help build these partnerships. And in San Diego, for example, created a, a program way back when called Adopt an Emergency Department, where we made sure every emergency department has an addiction clinic um, to follow up with. Electronic health records uh, can be adjusted to be more proactive in screening for addiction and have built-in dot phrases and treatment sets for um, MOUD. Wonderful. Yes, I think it's just so important to have that institutional support and those incentives to make it happen also. Um, 
you know, it, as you were saying, uh, you said, it said it so well about, you know, this should be just part of, of medical practice. It should be the standard of care, like hypertension treatment, like uh, uh, diabetes treatment. What examples do you have of how we can really mainstream this so that it does become part of primary care, emergency medicine, all the areas of medicine and part of medical education? Um, what, what's out there and what do you see on the, on the horizon in terms of making mainstreaming, uh, particularly opioid uh, treatment? So the first thing is closing the educational gap, right? So for right now, we have 2 million providers who can provide MAT. They need that education. And that MAT Act, Medication Access and Training Expansion Act, that is part of removing the X waiver, um, comes with a requirement of education. So starting June 27, 2023, DEA licensees are required to complete a one-time eight-hour training on opioids or other substances disorder in order to get their license or to renew their DEA license. And that education has a lot more flexibility and is an op has an opportunity for education. So I, I see what, what's happened, is, and it'll just be a matter of time, but the education is going to get there. I have two daughters in medical school, and they were taught about opioid addiction during their first year of school, and will get that training through their residency program. Uh, many, if not all medical specialties have been working on the issue um, for a number of years and being part of the National Academy of Medicine Action Collaborative on Countering the U.S. Opioid Epidemic, the educational community has been working on integrating this education. As far as best practices, there are hospitals with the gold standard, which I would say that they have addiction medicine services as part of their hospital, just like they have uh, consultation services for cardiology or infectious disease. This is the gold standard that's not yet available nationwide, but I think that that is the goal that we should be striving for. An example of partnerships between hospitals and addiction services is the BRIDGE program. Now, many of California's hospitals are part of the BRIDGE program providing medication for opioid disorder for withdrawal and addiction 24 seven. And some hospitals are more established with this resources, but everyone's in, is improving. And it's an excellent community partnership model. One of the key educational points is that substance use disorder is a treatable chronic disease of the brain. That, and um, I'm sure everyone in the audience knows that, but that's something that is emphasized and helps elevate that in order to be integrated in regular medical care. Wonderful. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the bridge program. One thing that I really love about the bridge program is in addition to, to just all the network of, that has been established with emergency departments, the linkages to, to uh, recovery services, all of that. They have such wonderful resources, almost a roadmap of how to do this. You know, that how you know, you want to start doing this. They have the videos, they have the 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 uh, protocols. They it is so helpful that kind of roadmap. And similar to Bridge, there are other resources out there. It's they, it's important for our audience to be aware of that. Um, just great work has been done in this area, such as uh, all the work that you've been doing on this, Dr. Lev. So thank you so much. And you know, speaking of our audience, we've seen we have people from throughout the United States people who are, are engaged in, in um, addressing the issue of opioid addiction and treatment uh, in different through different roles. What are some concrete steps that they can take in their communities to try to support the adoption of MAT among providers in their community? Right, so that's a great question. And there are two things everyone on this call um, can help uh, do and, and elevate. One of them is resources, and the second one is partnerships. Resources you already mentioned. So there's an educational gap that needs to be closed, and the California Bridge Program and the National Clinical Consultation Center are great resources that really need um, to be publicized and are available for free for um, the medical community to use anywhere in the United States. So the California Bridge uh, program, as you mentioned, it, um, the resources we'll put in the chat is cabridge.org. They have great tools on how to start buprenorphine quickly in the emergency department or how to do self-start of buprenorphine out, outside. So that's a great resources, the California Bridge program. And the other resources is with the National Clinical Consultation Center, the NCCC. They provide professional to professional advice in treating opiate use disorder as well as 
alcohol and poly substance use. So if you have a complex patient or it's your very first time, you know, you have your buprenorphine, you can write for it. You don't know how, what dose is, but there's other problems. You have questions. That is normal. We, we've had such um, questions when, when, with treatment for HIV and, um, uh, and, and PEP. Uh, medications. And the same consultation that helped us through the AIDS epidemic is helping medical professionals through the addiction uh, problem. And they you can call them 24-7 in California and Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. throughout the United, rest of the, of the United States um, and get one-on-one -on -one assistance with a patient who needs um, a, a treatment help and a provider needs a little help. So those are two excellent resources. The community can help um, promote and uh, um, with the medical uh, community. And it's every medical institution, wherever you are, there is a champion. And you can you just need to find that champion. Uh, years ago, parents found me, created me <laughs> into being a champion. This was, was not, you know, I was just a, a, an emergency physician, didn't know anything specific about addiction, except for people who have drug problems come to the emergency department. And, and a group of parents found me and, you know, trained me up really to become an advocate. And, and somebody like me exists in, in your community. I promise you, you need to find them, give them these resources and they'll be an invaluable resources for the rest of their career. Um, the, the second one is partnership. And, and hospitals need to learn how to work outside the four walls and partner with detox centers, um, rehab centers, warm handoff for addiction specialists, um, peer counselors, this needs to be developed in each community. And, and so the two concrete things that, that everyone can do is number one, find the champion and provide the resources to that champion. And number two is create that partnership. Wonderful. Yeah, when you were mentioning the champions, I was remembering when um, I was a chief medical officer at a coalition of community health centers and we were implementing uh, medication for opioid use disorder in our various uh, health centers. There was no substitute for having a, a respected uh, uh, colleague uh, uh, clinician in that health center who really knew what it was like to work in that health center, who the population was and everything. It just makes such a difference, uh, very important. And then of course, the other thing we, we've been, uh, the, the, that partnership so important with the individual institutions and then community-wide with coalitions has just been such a, it's such an um, important um, uh, resource for really affecting change, for maximizing impact. Uh, thank you, excellent, excellent uh, input. Um, so you've done just a wonderful job of explaining what the X waiver was, how, how the X was, waiver was X'd, and uh, the implications of this, and what we can be doing on a local level. I'm curious to know, you know, in addition to this change in the removing the X waiver, what else do you see on on the horizon for improving uh, access to addiction treatment? So um, the future, um, I, I'm very excited and optimistic for the future of addiction treatment innovations, and also for prevention. Um, for addiction treatment, I see a future where addiction treatment is integrated with physical and mental health. Like Senator Patrick Kennedy coined the phrase, getting a checkup from the neck up. And I expect that that would be part of routine healthcare visit. I see a future where every large hospital system has an addiction medicine service. We have palliative care consultation, infectious disease consultation. If we had addiction medicine services, we'd be very busy and there's a really need for that service. In terms of innovations, there's a lot of promising innovations and research in the field of addiction. Dr. Nora Wolkoff, the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, has a budget of $1.5 billion, more than that, and with potential vaccines for opioids and other treatments on the horizon. I did a podcast with Dr. James Mahoney, who is researching brain stimulators for addiction. Mm -hmm. And I advise a company called Clear Scientific that has a sequestrant medication for methamphetamine that would deactivate methamphetamine within minutes and eliminate it from the, pod, from the body. I did a podcast with them too. And I really can't wait to use their medication in the emergency department. In terms of prevention, I have a lot of hope in the field of prevention science. We talk a lot about treatment, but in order to have a new generation of Americans who have less addiction, we need who need less treatment, we have to really invest in prevention. My husband's a dentist, so by 
brushing and flossing, we prevent people from having cavities and he has less business, but that's a good thing. Primary prevention means preventing a disease before it's established. And it means teaching kids to protect their brain until age 25 when their brain is done growing. And data shows that each year, a higher percentage of 12th graders choose to be abstinent from all drugs, alcohol, nicotine, and any drugs. And before age 25, the risk of addiction is seven times higher than for adults. So by delaying or preventing drug use, we would now decrease the prevalence of addiction in our society. The other primary prevention measure is teaching kids to manage anxiety and depression with healthy behaviors rather than using drugs. There are educational programs that have met the scrutiny of randomized control trials that are proven to be helpful in preventing substance use and other undesirable behavior. And I see an increased number in communities that are investing in this type of education. Investing in treatment without the balance of investing in preventions like bailing water out of a ship without plugging the hole. Investing in prevention is much cheaper than addiction treatment. Excellent. I just uh, so appreciate your focus on prevention in addition to all of the important interventions when addiction is present. Thank you so much. And boy, we have a lot of enthusiasm from our audience and a lot of questions. So we're going to move in now to some of, the, some of these questions that our audience is, is posing for you, Dr. Lev. Um, one of those questions was about the, you'd mentioned the uh, methadone and overdose deaths. It, just wondering if this was prescription, pre, methadone prescribed for pain, or um, was it uh, um, at treatment uh, centers, at treatment programs? Um, that's a very good question. And um, the research that I did was with the medical examiner. So when you're dead, we don't know where you got the drug from, but we're able to look at prescriptions. And for the for the one year where there were 46 methadone deaths, um, the majority of them were not obtained within the prescription community. Now, uh, methadone uh, from an OTP does not go into the prescription drug monitoring system. And that's a gap that needs to be fixed. We want to, you know, integrate medical care um, and addiction care. So I can't say for sure, but uh, it did sound the alarm. Did these methadone that people died from, they were not prescribed. So did they come from the methadone clinic? Did they come from, you know, uh, Mexico or illegally somehow? Um, I can't say for sure, but, but it, it, it was an issue. Thank you. And, and there's another uh, methadone question here. It says, do you have a sense of whether or not it will eventually be possible for the physicians and other prescribers to sp prescribe methadone uh, as a, uh, with outside of a, of a, of a, a regular methadone program? Uh, this is essential for the continuity of care, especially where a person requires care in a long-term facility. And it, it goes on, but that, I think that's the essence of the, the question. Do you think this might happen? I, I do feel that people who practice addiction medicine needs, need to have a full tool chest of being able to do things. And methadone is one of them. But mm -hmm. I would caution that we don't just make methadone legal for everybody in the same community and then watch the history repeat itself with deaths. I mean, it needs, to, I, I would say, that people who do this for a living in a control setting um, should have that tool. But to open it up to the entire medical community, um, I would say we should learn from history not to do that. Thank you. Thank you. There was a little bit of confusion and, and some concern about the changes with X waiver. Uh, one of our audience members said PCPs experienced in uh, MOUD have uh, that they've, this person has spoken to wondered if the newly dropped X waiver might soon be replaced by some other potentially more cumbersome set of guidelines. Is the fear justified? And then kind of along with that, the, the, the question was, is the X waiver completely eliminated? And I have a feeling that might have to do with the educational requirement that's been placed, which is creating a little bit of confusion. Right. Um, great news. And it reminds me how, like, you know, when you play telephone, you know, when you pass the information about how it gets distorted at the end, um, the X waiver is gone, done, not coming back, um, you know, probably for my lifetime. Um, so, so that, that's, that's done. Now, all, anybody with a DA license can prescribe buprenorphine. Okay. As a, as of today, you can all do that. 
Um, the second part of that legislation was the eight hour education requirement that has a lot of flexibility. It's not like the old X waiver education that was a government mandated and selected education that everybody had to take. Um, it's now a one time requirement for um, anybody with a DEA license to attest to that they took such education. Physicians like me who already took the X waiver course or board certified in addiction medicine don't have to do that. Any of the medical students coming out already getting that as part of their education, they're not gonna have to do that. So it's the middle-aged old doctors who haven't um, done that, that will re require to take some type of education. Anyone, it's very flexible as to what that education could be. This is um, also a potential for your local coalitions um, to provide free education of whatever you want to educate those physicians um, to learn about uh, addiction medicine and hopefully to learn how to, to prescribe. But to answer the question, no, it's gone. It's not coming back. Um, it'll take an act of Congress to get it back in and it took an act of Congress to get it out. So that's not happening anytime soon. Great, thank you. And, and I appreciate your mentioning what communities can do to provide a continuing medical education as part of that to help local physicians and other prescribers uh, meet this requirement. And free medical education get, tends to uh, be very helpful since uh, providers require that for, ma for maintenance of their license in addition to, to being able to prescribe. Uh, I just want to mention, we have a, a lot of questions, so I know we won't get through all of them, but we are going to do our very best and we will make a copy of these questions um, and make sure if you don't mind, we'll send them to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, there's uh, there was a question as to uh, why do you think the uptake of naltrexone is lower than that for buprenorphine or methadone? Is it more driven by prescriber reluctance or patient discomfort? Uh, I get that I hear that question a lot is why is there why is naltrexone not used as much? And um, I think that's why I kind of spent some time explaining what the three different drugs are. Uh, methadone, there is a barrier, right? Uh, you need compliance. you You can't just give this to someone um openly, give them a month's supply of methadone. Uh, like you do with buprenorphine that has a natural safety or you'll, or people will die. I mean, it, it's, it's dangerous. It has to be, when you start it, it has to be very controlled and why that's why the OTP clinics are, 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 are good at, at that. They have a much more controlled setting that a clinic can't provide. Um, so that's um, uh, one, one uh, question. Buprenorphine is just, it's easy, right? You, you give, you know, you measure a cow score, you give eight milligrams, you prescribe it, and you can follow up and, and, and adjust the dose. With naltrexone, you have to have a patient who's been off of all opioids for seven or 10 days. That means they're going through withdrawal without the help of suboxone. Um, so it makes it more tricky. So you need a more compliant patient. So it, that doesn't work well in the emergency department setting. Uh, it's better for an outpatient setting. Um, so it's good to have, again, all three tools because there's no one size fits all for addiction treatment, as we all heard. Um, we're actually trying to make one size fit three, um, at, uh, also not perfect, but that's the tools that we have. And understanding um, the indications and the barriers help know like why one is used more than the other. Thank you. Um the, uh, there's a question, another question about the actual required training now within the eight hour training for prescribers is the importance of traditional therapies as well as mental health treatment addressed. Uh, their concern is that prescribers, uh, with prescribers prescribing medications for MOUD, um, th th those individuals may have mental health comorbid issues that uh, won't be addressed. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so first of all, the training, it's, there's not a mandatory training for MAT like there was with the X waiver. It's an eight hour education that's very flexible in the whole field of uh, addiction, medicine, and pain. Um, the, the concern about mental health and overlap is, is real, right? We know that there's a, a large percent of maybe 50% of people who have a substance disorder have a mental health use disorder and a significant amount of people who have a mental health use disorder also have a substance use disorder. That needs to be dealt with. There needs to be partnerships. We have partnerships with our orthopedic surgeons who have a broken, you know, patients have a broken bone or with a cardiologist when people have heart disease. 
we need those type of tech, um, partnerships and there aren't enough resources that needs to be built um, with the uh, addiction uh, treatment and with mental health providers. So that's that that um, you know whoever put that question, it, it it's real and it needs to be addressed. And uh, we need help making that happen. And, and there are great models where um, anybody with a substance use disorder is automatically screened for a mental health uh, um, uh, issue and given treatment for that as well. Of course, handling both together is going to get better results than anyone on its own. Thank you. Definitely important. And it's, it's also an opportunity for communities, if you're going to help with that continuing education, to make sure it includes some of those, uh, uh, addresses some of the mental health issues also. Um, what can behavioral health facilities do to get buy-in from physical medicine practitioners? Uh, this is somebody from Pennsylvania. They're struggling to get buy-in, um, hospitals and primary care. But as soon as addiction's mentioned, um, they, uh, there's less interest. I think you discussed this very well during the, the um, during the talk, but anything additional you'd like to add to that? It's kind of my favorite thing to do. I like getting people who don't get along and don't talk to each other and put them in the same room together and, and get them to be all friends. <laughs> and, and it's definitely possible. Um, you just create the incentive. So if you have people in, in Pennsylvania um, and you want to get them together, you bring them into to a task force, invite key mm -hmm. leaders of each one of those from behavior health, from physical health together and say, Here's, here's a, an issue. Here's some case examples. People love case examples. What can we all do? What can each of you do? And you'd be amazed what happens when you put the same people together in a room um, in a way to uh, activate a, a medical community. People in, like that. I mean, I do that every month with public health and public safety, you know, organizations who seemingly appear to be diametrically opposed. And when we know that we're together to save lives, we have the same mission, you know, everything's possible. So I think it's just a matter of identifying the key people in the community that you want to get along and, and work together and put them together and, and, and create that as a goal. Absolutely. Great synergy in that uh, collaborative effort. Thank you. Um, one question that kind of uh, clarification with the elimination of the X waiver, the, will there continue to be any kind of limit on the number of patients that a uh, physician or other prescriber can uh, carry it at one time. Interesting. No, no limits. Um, you know, as I was getting ready for this, um, for this webinar, I looked up like X waiver and I found a site that charges $99 and you just call in and you can get your buprenorphine prescription. So capitalism, I think already has gone into that. And um, I don't know, there may be some pill mills forming for buprenorphine. Um, but uh, if that goes in order to save lives, I guess that that would be okay. But um, no, no limits. Thank you. Um, there's another question here about how would you suggest someone ask a provider about being prescribed buprenorphine without having to prove that they are addicted? I feel M uh, MAT uh, clients should not have to push that they are addicted to be prescribed bupes since we know stigma is the biggest barrier to people seeking medical attention. Um, MAT should I, be I don't think you, yeah. I don't agree with hiding your medical diagnosis from your doctor, right? It's like, oh, I want an antibiotic, but I don't want to tell you I have a sore throat. Does that make sense? You need to be honest because you need to figure out other things like drug interactions, other things that's going on in your life. So um, I, I think if if you have an opiate use disorder, you say that to your doctor. You don't have to say I'm addicted. You could say I have an opiate use disorder. Um, I want to try uh, buprenorphine. Um, and I, really I think you need to be honest with your physician. It, it, it's it, it's important if you're hiding something that perpetuates stigma. The way to dispel stigma, we and we have experience with this with HIV when doctors weren't allowed to know that you had HIV. Like wh where did that go? When it became open. We're able to prescribe more, provide more. Um, we had tools to, to do that. Um, I, I think the way to get rid of stigma is by by openness. Um, and uh, so you could say that. I mean, I would I would just say you know I'm you know I, I've had or I had one or I I, I think I have, and then you'd get the right screening and you'd get the mental health referrals. 
I mean, just asking for a prescription without being, you know, open. I don't know if I'd be comfortable as a physician doing that. I want, I can't just say, just give me this prescription. I want to, I need to, the whole picture. Definitely. Hope with mainstreaming of, of questioning about substance use and treatment, we can eventually overcome some of this uh, stigma and, and people will be more comfortable. Um, really important question. With the new legislation, what is the impact on telehealth? And kind of within that question too, we know that telehealth has been so helpful in implementing uh, uh, medication for opioid use disorder, particularly important in, in um, rural areas that can face uh, challenges that in addition to those that are faced in urban areas. Or there's overlap, but there's some that are unique to rural or urban situations. But overall, could you say a little bit about telehealth, the impact, and then how you see the challenges of uh, rural areas and how these can be addressed. So the pandemic really taught us that telemedicine can work for many medical conditions. Uh, not perfect, but it's definitely helpful. And I think we can use telehealth instead of the emergency department for many patients who have opiate withdrawal or need addiction treatment. I would need some vital signs, but that could be done remotely. So telehealth is crucial in rural areas. And will continue to be implemented, especially in rural areas. The Biden administration plans to end the COVID-19 public health emergency May 11th, 2023, and they plan on continuing to expand and extend telehealth services for rural health, behavioral health, and telehealth options beyond the public health emergency. Um, a DA letter from March, 2020, allowed prescribing buprenorphine to new or existing uh, patients uh, via phone consultation without a, a visit first. I don't know if that will actually extend past May 2023. As far as urban versus rural treatment of addiction, um, um, rural areas have barriers um, for heart disease and orthopedic care. And COVID has impacted rural communities with hospital closures and the need to travel much further for medical care and rural areas have less addiction professionals per population, um, just like they have less orthopedic surgeons. So, but what rural communities do really well is accessing telehealth and establishing consultation services with receiving centers. So rural areas need to use that same method of accessing specialty care to addiction treatment as they do for cardiology, dermatology, or any other specialties. And because of the lack of access, Rural communities have a more urgent need to train up primary care providers to use medication for opioid use disorder. And rural doctors usually have to do more and have a wider scope of practice than urban doctors uh, because of that. Um, and now they'll be adding addiction to that scope. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're at the almost to the end of our time. And I know we still have many more questions. Uh, we will make sure we write all these down so they are part of the, the notes for this show, which will be available on our, our website. And uh, Dr. Lev will ask if you could respond to some of these additional questions also. Uh, there's just been such a, a high level of interest in the information that you've provided. And we really wanna thank you, um, you know, for all the work you've done, particularly for your work Xing the X waiver and for this excellent explanation of the implications uh, of, of this major change that we have been waiting for for so long. Thank you very much, Dr. Lev, for, for your no, participation and, in the webinar. And, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, the National Opioid Prevention Network, and thank you to all the coalition members for boots on the ground work that you do on a local level. You are the heart of protecting your community and saving lives from addiction, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lev. And can I have the next slide, please? We are just at the, at the end. We do wanna make sure you're aware. I think there's one more slide, here we go. Uh, we just wanna make sure that you all have our website uh, address. Please feel free to contact us and um, join the, the National Overdose Prevention Network and attend additional webinars. And my thanks to all of you for the important work that you are doing in each and every one of your communities. We will have another webinar, which is part of the California Overdose Prevention Network, Youth Overdose Prevention. We've, this is part of a, a multi-part uh, presentation we're doing, and it's opportunities for teens and adolescents. And that information is available next Tuesday, April 25th. Thank you again for all the work you do, and thank you so much for joining us today. Bye-bye.